Yuan Zhen Liang, National Taiwan University. I work on medieval and early modern Spanish history, including the Spanish Mediterranean. Can everyone in the back hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, I would prefer not to use a microphone. Okay. My story starts in 1537. I am Martin de Cordoba, the Count of Alcaldete and the Governor of Oran. I am sailing from Malaga in Spain to Oran in Algeria. The journey can take as short as 16 hours. But that wasn't my experience in September 1537. I write to Juan Vázquez de Molina, a longtime associate and royal secretary of the Emperor Charles V. I am Martín de Córdoba, and for me, crossing the Sea of Alborán, the western stretch of the Mediterranean that gradually compresses into the Strait of Gibraltar, makes me veer from one emotion to another. And let me read along with you. My voyage has taken as long as the king of Tremethen, to fulfill his terms. That is a very long time. I set sail from Malaga and the weather held up until we put into the Cape of Falcon, three leagues from Oran. There we met a contrary wind which sent me back eight leagues to the Cape of Bigal, a port on the coast, although I am not sure where, but I was there for seven days. The ship was overloaded so I had to send away some unnecessary people and other things when it was possible for four brigantines to depart. Although I was advised to leave with them, those staying behind were so frightened of the weather and enemy ships that I did not dare abandon them since any enemy ship passing by would have had no trouble seizing them. From there, with little wind and a strong current, we were taken to Risco, where we passed Saturday, the first of this month. Picture it, your honor. How would you have felt to see me with my one ship just sitting there in Risco? Comparing the length of my travels to the King of Tremesen's endless delay, the feeling I express we might as well call snark or petulance. Describing the miserable soldiers on the ship, I display a mix of sympathy for their fear of the weather and of Muslim corsairs, and of condescension that my presence could, claim that my presence could calm them down. But most striking of all are my emotions of disorientation or perhaps decontextualization. From not knowing where I am, from, not, from being thrown hither and thither by contrary winds, and lastly, from just sitting there, wasting time, and kind of drawing a big old blank, because there isn't anything I can do about the situation. Contextualization is a central part of a historian's craft. And the reason why I didn't show you this map first, uh, to uh, show you the journey from Malaga to Oran, because I am going to stress decontextualization, uh, disorientation in this talk. Detachment, which is supposed to be a historian's duty, I personally began this morning's talk by identifying myself with Martin de Cordoba. Instead of contextualization and detachment, I want to focus on sensory perception, and from sensory perception, a sense of emotion, about the experience of one particular Spanish governor in the waters of the Western Mediterranean and the coast of North Africa. As researchers of the Mediterranean, we seek to know the place, but it is also important to recognize what isn't known by our subjects, such as Martin de Cordoba, in the 16th century. My talk today is about Spanish sensory perception of North Africa in the 16th century, and it's going to show the ways that, uh, I, that it's going to show the ways that disorientation and decontextualization, what I enacted just now, was part of the experience. Disorientation in a sea that's been called in the diminutive a Roman lake a Muslim lake, a sea that had been seemingly mastered starting thousands of years before by Phoenicians and Greeks. In th indeed, the sea may have constancy, despite the capriciousness of water, weather, and erosion. But how do humans perceive it? How do humans experience it? How? With emotion. This is a turn from topography to geography, from the natural state of things to a human conception of things, and here I'm referencing Ramsey Ruihi's distinction between topography and geography. Starting in 1415, Portuguese and Spaniards conquered a series of settlements on the coast of North Africa. One of these towns was Oran, seized in 1509, the largest enclave under Spanish control. By the time Martin de Cordoba became governor of Oran in the mid-1530s, however, the balance of power has shifted. Spanish hegemony was being challenged by the Ottoman captain Gerardin Babaroja, who had co consolidated his power over Algiers and made it the Mediterranean's coarser capital par excellence. 
Indeed, his fleet threatened the shores of the Spanish mainland, the Baleares Islands, the Italian mainland, the Sicilian and Maltese Islands. But because of the fleeting nature of Barbarroja's fleet, Spaniards and their allies were constantly asking, where is Barbarroja? This question, it seems, reveals more disorientation in the Mediterranean. This is a question that Don Alvaro de Batan, Admiral of the Spanish Mediterranean galleys, asks over and over again at the interrogation of Shava Raiz, a captain in Barbarroja's fleet, on July 6, 1537. A transcript of the interrogation sent to the Spain's Council of State preserves the list of questions posed to Shaba Raiz and the captain's responses. Let me read that with you. Question, when did Barbarossa, um, this is the English version of this name, where did Barbarossa's fleet depart? May 5th, 1534. Where was Barbarossa's fleet? Half in Gallipoli in Turkey uh, and half in Constantinople. How many galleys does Barbarossa have? 80 from the Grand Turk, 6 from his own, and 25 of diverse origin. How many heavy galeotas like the one carrying Barbarossa? 4. How many lighter galeotas? 5 of, Bar five of Barbarossas, 4 of the Grand Turks. Do the galleys need to be greased with tallow? A part of the fleet does. It's been done in haste, and food and supplies are being loaded now. What does Barbarossa want to do with the fleet? Raid the coast of Calabria, Italy, and then sail on to Tunis. Where is Barbarossa currently located? If Barbarossa is alive, he's now in Tunis. The location of Barbarossa, Barbarroja, the Ottoman admiral, is of obvious interest for the purposes of Spanish military mobilization and strategy. Will Barbarroja lay siege to Oran? Will he lay siege to La Goleta? Will Barbarroja take his fleet to the coast of Andalusia? Or will he raid the Baleares Islands? The question is asked over and over again in the 1520s, 1530s by a variety of personnel in many parts of the Mediterranean. As the documents preserved in the sections of Estado and Guerra Antigua in the Archivo General de Simancas repeatedly remind us. The question is asked so many times that apparently it becomes something of a joke. Like a joke about the bogeyman, an imaginary evil character with supernatural powers that's supposed to carry off naughty children. On August 4, 1536, Bernardino de Mendoza, governor of the Spanish Presidio of La Goleta in Tunisia, dryly observes to Francisco de los Cobos, one of the Emperor Charles V's most powerful secretaries, there hasn't been any news in La Goleta since the last time I wrote your lordship, except for daily predictions of the coming of Barbarroja. It's like Jews waiting for the coming of the Messiah. Neither one or the other has shown up yet. A quest to know the location or movements of Barbarroja and his fleet in the Mediterranean results in a consistent lack of knowledge in this geographic situation in the Mediterranean. What's more, a human quest for information also encounters the inconstancy of information, an inconstancy that is inextricably tied to the constancy of human agency, will, and action to move around. But hey, didn't I just say Barbarossa took over Algiers and made it his base? So why can't we just find Barbarossa in Algiers, a city he helped to build into a corsair powerhouse? If that's the case, how did Spaniards perceive of Algiers, where Barbarossa was supposed to be? A series of maps preserved in the Archivo General de Simancas was produced circa 1603 of Algiers. Okay, and here I'd like to qualify, this is some uh, 60 years after Barbarroja's death, uh, and therefore this is a later representation of Algiers, uh, but the sample size of uh, maps showing Algiers is very limited in the Spanish archives that I have seen. So in this series of four maps, let us first consider the first one, uh, one that provides a view of the city and its environs. At the center of, and the focus of the map, though perhaps not dominating it, is the city of Algiers. This is a city in miniature. A few major roads can be observed. Seven buildings are named. Uh, and these are the Tower of La Guardia, the Castillo uh, do Luchali, the Castillo de Alambasha, the Castillo del Imperador. Uh, also shown on the miniature of the city of Algiers is the Jati de Muelle, uh, known as the Pignon de Arjel, that sticks out into the bay. 
A few other buildings representing settlements dot the landscape directly to the upper right of Algiers. This almost completely represents the human activity depicted by the map. In contrast, the map seems to be a celebration of topography. The dominating graphic element in the map is a colorful band representing the coastline that by taking two big, S, uh, two big twists kind of forms a rough S that covers the length of an otherwise plain piece of paper. It is worth noting that one curve of the S forms a bay, a shelter for ships, and her perhaps an invitation for Spanish attention. While the coast turns this way and that way, the band is fairly consistent in width and color, a verdant green. Consistent as well is the depiction of slopes of the terrain, with the land rising relatively rapidly from the waters of the Mediterranean. And here, the map, by infusing some brown shading into the green, and then molding concave shell shape, si uh, shapes, seashell shapes, skillfully represents this hill hilly landscape and the steepness of the slope. Overall, the map evokes an elegance and a balance. This balance is further emphasized by the placement of the main text, the Mar Mediterraneo, uh, below, and above uh, a scale measuring the distance of one lead divided into regular 3,000, 2,000, 1,000, and 500 steps. And you can see an enlargement of that scale in the upper right. The whole composition of the map quietly screams the ordered mind of an engineer. The 1603 series contains three more maps, and the second one resembles a zoomed up version of the first. Here are elements that are repeated from the previous map. The prominent jati, the city walls, major arteries, fortresses, and towers. Perhaps most noticeable in the map is how the city walls form, again, a remarkably consistent shape, an almost uniform square. Also noticeable is the densely packed urban landscape with roads, main gates, fortresses at the edge water, and a miasma of buildings. It is so densely packed as to resemble a Where's Waldo Vigil puzzle, or perhaps in this case it would be more appropriate to say a game of Where is Barbarroja, set in an Algerian urban landscape. Mm. And indeed the series of maps is a visual puzzle of sorts, because the third map in this series keeps the general outline of the city walls and the topography, but reduces the urban landscape to a few buildings, which appear to be mosques with their minaret towers, though they curiously took uh, the shape of parochial churches that doff a typical Spanish cityscape. And the fourth map in the series strips out the urban landscape entirely, leaving the representation of the city to just the walls, otherwise the city is represented as just blank space. At first glance, one might think that the series of maps demonstrates the process of map making. With this last map as a template, and if we were to go through the series, more and more elements are added to create a complete and finished product. And indeed, the Spanish art historian Alicia Camara Munoz of the UNED explains that this may have been the case. However, Camara Munoz continues relating that these maps were designed to serve a military purpose so that officers and soldiers could envision the city as a bustle of buildings and presumably inhabitants and then in ever more reductionist forms the city as its strongholds, fuertes, such as mosques and the city with only its walls and openings, brechas. Uh, uh, so in such a sense, Camara Munoz even suggests that perhaps it is an empty map, that it is the most complete, at least for military purposes. And yet, I'd like to posit another way to look at the maps, one that refers back to the talk's focus on detextualiz decontextualization, disorientation, and lack of knowledge. Four, do these maps, in whatever form or, com or completion, in whatever order, represent the physical reality of Algiers? Maps, of course, form parts of imaginaries, and they constitute objects of ideological uh, discourses. But let us consider two more maps to offer an interpretation. The first drawing that you see here, located in a manuscript in the Bibliothèque Royale de Belgique in Brussels. This manuscript contains 169 drawings depicting famous sieges in the 16th and the early 17th century European warfare. 
Though I have not been able to ascertain either the author or the date it was created, the last drawing is of the capture of the castle of Wolwe, the Prise de Chateau de Wolwe, which took place in 1610. The drawing on folio 9 of the series depicts the Emperor Charles V's failed 1541 siege of Algiers. And some qualifications again, this map is obviously imagined, as the series was made at least 70, uh, 70 years after the campaign. But even more, the map is largely empty of content. If we take a look at, if we analyze the map as divided into three horizontal horizontal bands, a top band, a middle band, and a bottom band. The top band is background, which the artist has chosen to fill up with sky. The bottom band is a derivative portrayal of warships in various states of distress since uh, the Spanish fleet was defeated at the, um, at the siege. Now the reason why I call it derivative is if compared to almost any other map in the series, the level of specific detail or any detail is quite lacking. These are uh, different parts of the Siege of Pavia of 1525 and of Vienna in 1527 in comparison. And you can see the density of um, details in these two comparisons in comparison to uh, the Siege of Algiers. The middle band of the Siege of Algiers should, however, hold our attention for a little while longer. Because as you can see, the square-shaped wall-enclosed city of the 1603 Simancas map makes an appearance here. Now the projection of the 1603 map onto a depiction of a siege that took place 60 years earlier is certainly specious. And by the principle guilty by association, one could say that the imaginary nature of the Brussels map reinforces the imaginary natures of the Simancas map. However, the intent of this talk isn't to determine accuracy as much as it is to mediate on disorientation. Towards that end, I'd like to show you a final map of Algiers, produced in 1563, some 40 years prior to the series um, of four maps. This map's origin is unknown, though it may very well be a captive's portrayal of the city, because it was filed with a request for King Philip II's assistant, assistance to ransom captives. And there is a list of names of captives inscribed on the back of the map. But the disorientation is striking. The city looks almost nothing like the 1603 map depicted uh, before. In a hypothetical debate about accuracy, this map may appear more attractive because of its apparently organic qualities. What's more, there's a bit more context to the map as it was filed along with a request for King Philip II's assistance to ransom captives and thus may indeed be a representation of the city based on the eyewitness account of a captive. Still, the 1603 maps and this one do share, similar, uh, do share similarities. The wall is recognizable, as are buildings such as fortresses, towers, gates, the jutti, but the differences certainly capture our attention. The map represents the city in a triangle. Elevation is equated with the top tip of the triangle. Buildings still fill up the urban landscape, but they, are, but they are curiously uniform in size and shape. There is even one bit of commentary, El Castillo de la Ciudad no es fuerte, uh, the castle of the city is not strong. The city completely dominates the image, and while it is connected with water, Algiers almost sits like a huge rock on that water, an island apart from its hinterland, separated by blank space as if the hinterland is falling off the wayside. And finally, the presence of human beings arranged in a line on the path to the wharf and the decorative fish. They are a bit cartoonish in their portrayal, like stick figures wearing an array of costumes, bearing an array of arms. Though there's still very much a tension between the organic and imaginary natures of this map, I'd like to conclude by stressing the disorientation of the map the city rising out of nowhere, and a certain alienness of the aesthetics of the drawing, especially in comparison to the order and rationality of the 1603 maps. It is by way of conclusion that I'd like to now turn very briefly to context to situate my, uh, my work in historiographical debates. And this context is very much 
um, of the historians Brodel and Horton and Purcell, uh, two of the major Mediterraneanists in the field. These are scholars who have focused on geography as one of the defining attributes of an interconnected Mediterranean. And it is through geography, the Mediterranean as a conduit, the Mediterranean as a confined space, that the interactive processes of communications, transportation, trade, migration, and warfare incubate. And even though there is a diversity of landforms, mountains, peninsulae, litoros, plains, climates, floral, and fauna, and the microecologies of Horton and Purcell. These topographies and ecologies are nevertheless a part of the intrinsic nature of the Mediterranean. And for the western corner of the Mediterranean, there's a further degree of symmetry, one that is represented in landforms. The, uh, oh, I didn't, sorry, I skipped this. This is the image of the um, human figurines and of the fish swimming in the Bay of Algiers uh, along that jetty. Um, so, in the interconnectedness of the Mediterranean that Horton and Purcell and Brodel talk about, let us focus on the uh, Western Mediterranean, uh, a part of the sea that narrows down into the Strait of Gibraltar, uh, which produces a certain degree of symmetry, one that is represented in landforms such as the Rock of Gibraltar in the north and the Mount Acho of uh, Theuta in the south, a symmetry that's also represented, okay, and here are again the two uh, rocks, Gibraltar on the left, um, Theuta on the right. That symmetry is also represented in the migrations, uh, the movement of populations from the south to north in the Middle Ages and from north to south in the early modern period. These symmetri symmetries seem to be so obvious that the historian Miguel Angel de Mutbunes Ibarra, the Dean of Spanish North African History at Basic, has remarked that Spaniards found a similar world when they conquered North Africa in the 16th century. Incidentally, this is also the point of departure that the organization I founded, the Spain North Africa Project, also takes regarding connections between the two shores. Nonetheless, and here I echo Jesus' remarks yesterday, Measurements of length and width, of elevation, of temperature, etc., do not necessarily coincide with human experience of that same space or time. Because human experiences are subjective. Busan's weather is very cold for someone coming from subtropical Taiwan, but this temperature is probably so banal as to be comfortable for a local person from Busan. As for the measurement of time, a 16th century ship could have sailed from Spain to Oran in as short as 16 hours, but Martin de Cordova's voyage with, an, uh, with um, an array of contrary winds, currents, and enemy ships turned out to be 28 days, leaving the governor of Oran with a sense of frustration, bewilderment, and resignation. Thank you so much for your attention this morning, and thanks to all the organizers of this conference for all their hard work making this forum possible today. Okay.